Assalamualaikum everyone. This is your host Ali Fayaz here today. Uh, this is going to be a session about. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Thanks now. Uh, while we are waiting for some some parents to still join, I thought we should, because we have been delaying for at least nine minutes already. Uh, this is an important session today for the about the education seminar where our kids will be talking about VC ATAR selective entry schools exams and things like that. Uh, my presentation so we can start the seminar before taking any any further time. I'll be sharing my screen with you guys. Can you all see my screen? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, so this is your host Ali Fayaz here, and this is about uh, this is the education sem seminar, which is hosted by KSIJ. And just a bit of a housekeeping. It's a request that everybody should mute their mic, and it's your discretion if you want to have your videos on or off. And you can use your uh, uh, chat option if you want to ask any questions before. Uh, we go to the end of the seminar and then we open up the forum for normal sort of chatting uh, questions face to face, virtual face to face. Uh, today our speakers are Nida uh, Ajani. Just a bit of a background for Nida. She studied at Al Taqwa School and moved to Susan Corey in grade nine after uh, the selective entry ex school exams, uh, passing that exam. Now she passed uh, this next entry exam without taking any tuitions, but, and all through uh, her self preparation, which means that you don't need to have uh, tuitions to get to these sort of, uh, you know, uh, selected entry schools. So if you're a bright student, you can do it without that. Nida passed out VC securing an ATAR of 96% and then studied Bachelor of Commerce at University of Melbourne. She's currently pursuing her Chartered Accountancy at Ernest & Young. So she will be our first speaker. And then our next speaker is going to be Arshia Merchant. Arshia studied school at school uh, at uh, St. Albans Secondary College and then moved to McRobertson's High School, which we call McRob in grade nine after passing her SEE. Arshia passed her uh, selective entry school exam with, with the uh, by going to the tuitions to Henderson Education Services, which is one of the uh, place where these things are taught for how to appear for these schools. The, the, the kids will talk about the, these things. Uh, Arshia passed VC securing an ATAR of 97% and finished her second year studying a double degree of Bachelor's of Commerce and International Relations at Monash University as a scholarship student, mashallah. Arshia worked at Kumon for three years and now she privately tutors kids from grade three to 10. Uh, then I will be talking about uh, this, uh, the selective entry school preparation and things like that, how to get there and what to do and how to take tuitions and things like that. Whereas Ursha will be talking about VCE, ATARs and things like that. So I will give it to Nida Ajani first to start the, the presentation. Nida, thank you. Thank you, Ayanko. Um, we'll just get the slides up and then we'll get started. Sure. Yep, just give me one moment and I'll share my screen with the slides. Okay, Lovely, can you thank you. So, um, just before we begin, welcome everyone. I hope we're all doing well. I am Nida and I will start us off today and then I shall take over. So to begin, here's just an overview of the session we're running today. Um, the first thing we'll focus on are the selective schools. So what school we have, what the process is like, what you can do to prepare and our experiences at these schools. Once that's done, our show will focus on the VC system and how the ATAR runs, how to pick the VC subjects when you get to year 11, and then just general VC advice and university beyond that. So to begin, 
we have four selective schools available over here in Melbourne. Those are Melbourne High, McCrobb, Susan Quarry, and Nossel. To provide some context, Melbourne High is an all boys school. McCrobb is an all girls school. Susan Quarry and Nossel are both co-ed schools. Now the first two schools, Melbourne High and McCrobb, are in the city. So they're very central. Nossel is based in Berwick and Suzanne Corey is in the West down in Werribee. With the four schools mentioned, it is very important to note that Melbourne High and McCrobb are older schools. They've been well established, they're well experienced. Suzanne Corey and Nossel are slightly newer. However, when making these decisions, it's important to keep location and convenience in mind, remembering that your child will go there for your ninth and year 12. So it's four years of travel, whatever's convenient to you. So the selection process for these schools, each year on average, there's about 6,000 candidates that sit the exam, while there's approximately across all four schools, generally an even number of space in all these four schools. Now, um, sorry, Arsh, I can't see the slides. Okay, yep, there it is, perfect, thank you. Okay. So with these places, we have students that are Right. Your selection essentially depends on a ranking system. So it, form, it is how well you perform compared to the peers sitting the exam with you. The highest scoring students are selected based on their preference. So sometimes you might not necessarily get your first preference and you might get your second. Um, with the year 10 mentioned, while there are some opportunities to reapply for year 10, it is important to remember that these are limited seats. These schools operate out of capacity so they first take their intake in year nine and year 10 applicants only consider there's a position available. So essentially, if someone leaves the school in year nine, a spot opens up is when you get the chance. Actually, the process for year 10 is very limited and I'd highly recommend applying in year nine initially. The year nine exam is also run by the Department of Education centrally for all four schools. However, if you wish to apply for year 10, that is run through the schools directly. So you would have to set an exam for every school that you want to apply for. What you can do to prepare. So here are just a couple of general tips. However, it's important to make sure that these work for you. The first one would be to practice the practice papers under timed conditions. You can get these papers from the department's website. Those are generally papers that are, have been run in the past year. However, you can also get practice papers from tutoring companies and things like that. So it's really important to make sure you practice these in timed conditions. Secondly, reading more. Um, four out of six of the assessments that you sit are English papers. There are two multiple choice English papers and two writing English papers. So it is really, really important to ensure that you perform well in these as these form a majority of your assessment. Reading more, whether it's newspapers or fiction novels or anything, will allow you to gain a better understanding of the language and how to appropriately use it. A lot of the times you know words, you know how to apply them properly. And so it's really important that you have a good grasp of the language. The next one, having someone check your work. Repeatedly completing practice papers that are not being corrected leads to the same mistakes being made over and over again, and essentially is a very ineffective method of study. Ensuring you're constantly marking each paper, whether it's you doing it yourself or getting someone else to do it for you, ensures that you reduce your mistakes and don't repeat them in the next one. The next one is for maths, preparing a list of topics and having a good understanding of them. It is really important to ensure that you have a good grasp because it's the same topics that get tested year on year. Despite them being different questions, it's the same topics that show up in your exams. So having a good understanding of these will help you perform well. It's important you compile a list of topics and then you work on them throughout the year. Some of these include geometry, trigonometry, ratios, and financial maths, just to name a few. English, as mentioned, very, very important to have a good grasp of the language. You have two writing pieces, which is one persuasive writing piece and one creative writing piece. This was previously a 15-minute paper and has now been increased to 30 minutes which implies there is now a higher quality of work required in this from students. As previously mentioned, reading more will allow for an improvement in your vocabulary and grammar usage. 
Now, um, as mentioned by Alianku, I sat the exam and I successfully got in without going to any tutoring center, whilst Arshia did. And because we both have these different experiences, we'll just talk about our experiences and what we found helpful for us. I came to studying, some of the pros I found personally was that it allowed me to work at my own pace. If there were topics I struggled with, I could spend a greater number of time on that as opposed to going to a tutoring center where things were run on a week by week basis. You either have a grasp of it or you don't. But if I decided by myself, I had the choice to spend more time on things that took me a while to understand and run through things that were slightly easier for me. I found I had a reduced workload just because you will often find that as students get to high school, they have an increased workload at school as is. Going to a tutoring center, having to you know, do your homework, attending those classes every week can often be time consuming and increase the workload for the child. So I just found it easier for myself that I work at my own pace, didn't have to worry about submitting homework elsewhere and I could focus on my school and study by myself. There's also reduced stress and pressure and this comes from the time you save as you're working at your own pace. You're not locked into attending classes every, on a certain day every week. You can work at your own time. With that said, there are some cons to self-studying. Number one being there's no accountability. There's no one to check in on you. There's no one checking in whether you're doing the right thing or not. You're solely working by yourself. Second one, it can sometimes be difficult to seek help just because if you're stuck on something, you don't have a tutor to go ask help. A lot of it just comes from Google, school teacher, things like that. And the next one, as mentioned before, while it is important to make sure you're getting your work marked. Sorry about that. Yeah, so as mentioned before, even though it is important to mark your own work and get that corrected, it's often difficult to mark your own work objectively, right? Because if you're marking yourself, you're slightly biased and you think you're saying something that you might not necessarily get it. It's just making sure you hold yourself accountable and remain strict with yourself when doing these things. Thanks, Arshia. Awesome. So, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, like Ali and Kul mentioned at the start, um, I went through the selective uh, school entrance exams through um, tutoring services through Henderson's is the particular one I went to. Um, so I found um, it really useful to go to Henderson's, uh, mainly because they um, helped me understand what kind of content is on the exams. Um, being the first student, uh, sorry, first child or from my family to do this exam. Um, I didn't really know anyone else that was doing the exam time or had done it in the past. So um, it really just helped me understand what kind of content would be on there, um, apart from just the vague uh, subject topics. Um, there was also a really good um, uh, kind of advantage in having a clear guidance on all your subjects with a lot of continuous feedback. Henderson's has a lot of uh, professional markers who mark your work, who mark your exams. Um, and so they're really uh, useful in letting you know where you stand, what you can improve on. They give you uh, really constructive uh, feedback, which is really, really relevant, especially for your writing pieces. As Nila was mentioning, you can tend to write, uh, mark your work subjectively um, and that can, you know, skew your results and things like that. This is a really good way of just having a third opinion um, to tell you, you know, what you can do to improve uh, and things like that. Um, apart from that, uh, like um, Nida mentioned, it's really, really important to do a lot of practice exams. And so I think that's where tutoring comes in most is that they are, have a lot of services that help you do practice exams in real time. So not just giving you the practice questions, but actually allowing you to sit in an environment where you can actually do the exam with a group of other students and feel that um, time constraint and time pressure. That's really helpful if you are a student who is likely to get stressed in that situation or just uh, confused in that sort of thing. So it helps you really get familiar with um, doing the exam, doing it in the time constraints, having all those people around you and things like that. Little things, but they can really go a long way um, if you are likely to get stressed on the day. Of course, however, um, there are some disadvantages. It does require a lot more time and extra commitment on top of your schoolwork, of course. Um, so you are doing additional planning and it does require 
um, you to think ahead. Um, spots can be limited, especially now with a lot more students um, applying to do these kind of exams than there were in the past. So obviously Henderson's and any particular tutoring service that you want to go to has a limited amount of classes and spaces. So that is something you do have to think about early. Um, of course, cost is a factor that you have to factor in on your own life. Um, and also it can be a competitive environment. Of course, you're going there um, with a lot of students who are all So just a little bit about our personal experiences. As mentioned earlier, I went to McRobb um, and Nida went to Suzanne Corey. So we're just going to talk a little bit about actually going there, um, whether these schools are right for you and what kind of environment there is. Um, so basically McRobb is an all girls school um, and it's kind of the sister school to Melbourne High, which is an all boys school. Um, I really loved going to McRobb. Um, I found that it really opened me up to a lot more um, opportunities and things that I wouldn't have really gotten in my old school. Um, it's really uh, girls like education focused, obviously being a girl, girl school. So it really focuses on providing those opportunities to emotion, girls emotion. and women who wouldn't necessarily receive them in the past. Um, on top of that, um, it's a really, it's a school that has a really, really rich history. Being really old and really well known in Melbourne um, allows it to have a lot of alumni and notable people. Um, on top of that, it helps it basically provide more opportunities that you couldn't at other schools. So for example, there's an accelerated learning program where you can study a year ahead and complete one of your, a couple of your um, VCE subjects early so that your pressure is taken off in uh, year 12, which is something we will talk about. There's a lot of opportunity for um, internationally recognized achievements, such as the Duke of Edinburgh Award, the World Challenge Award, things like that, that can help your, your child or yourself um, gain those sort of uh, achievements that you can put on your resume and things like that when you're applying to places in the future and really help you get the most out of your school experience. There's a lot of um, international study tours. We had one that went to NASA in the United States. We had one that went to Europe for uh, literature and history. Um, and so they're really trying to cater to build your experiences outside of just the academic thing. Of course, the academic thing is really, really important and something that they put a lot of emphasis on. But it's um, there's a lot of recognition that you are a complete person and that there are other opportunities out there. And uh, we do have quite a few sister schools around um, the world. So we teach quite a few different languages, which are really useful depending on what kind of field you want to go to. So we teach French, German, Japanese, Indonesian, Latin. It's quite a different, um, a lot of opportunities and things like that. Um, it is, of course, as Nitha mentioned at the start, really important to know that because McRobb is in the city, it is very likely that um, you will be training in or public transport transporting in, um, which is a factor you do have to consider. You will have to catch a train every morning and in the evening. And so it is um, an issue for time management, that sort of thing. But it's definitely not debilitating. And there's like everyone at the school is going through the same thing as you. So it is really communal. Um, and it's not something that's going to ruin your high school experience completely. But it is a factor you do have to think of when you are deciding. And Nila, do you want to talk about Suzanne Corey? Yeah, lovely, thank you. Um, so as mentioned, I went to Suzanne Corey and Suzanne Corey was a co-ed school. Um, going back to my past, before that I went to Octopa College where I was in an all girls classroom. And so as a personal experience, I found being in a co-ed school very helpful in just building my confidence and growing into who I am as a person. Um, a lot of the experiences we have at these four selective schools are very common. So as Arsha mentioned, there are a lot of international learning opportunities, volunteering opportunities, and these are essentially very, very important for your future resume because these look really good in there. So anything you've done in school and just having extracurricular activities shows that you are more than just an academic person and that you do have these experiences that help you build onto your character and personality. In terms of language learning opportunities, at Susan Corey, we had Chinese and French. Those were the two options we had. And once again, you could just pick whichever one you really wanted to and which one worked best for you. 
Awesome. So that concludes our sort of section on uh, selective school, um, the entrance exams. Of course, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or we can answer them at the end if there's anything specific we didn't touch on. But we are going to move on to the VCE and ATAR section, which is more relevant for older students, um, year 10, year 11, year 12, that kind of thing. Um, and I'll be doing this little section. So... Uh, pretty much we'll just start with explaining the ATAR and ATAR is hopefully something you've heard of or know what it is, um, but it's kind of difficult to explain exactly what it is. It stands for the Australian Tertiary Admissions Ranking and it's the score you get at the end of year 12. Um, it's a basically a ranking that helps you um, get into university, it helps universities decide which students to take and which courses to offer them and things like that. It is of course a ranking. So it measures a student's academic, um, overall academic achievement compared with all the final year students in Australia in that year. So it's not really possible to uh, figure out your ATAR based on your scores in that year. Obviously you can sort of gauge them par on past years, but it's a ranking, so it does change every year. Um, the highest ATAR you can get is a 99.95, which means you are in the top five percentile of students in Australia. So the higher ATAR you get, um, the higher percentile you are in. Um, basically, the ATAR is calculated using your study scores for the six subjects you complete in VC, and it creates an aggregate score, which then translates to the ATAR. This is something we'll talk about in the next coming slides, and we'll go through how that kind of um, ends up being calculated. And just again, it's an estimate of the per percentage of the population that you outperformed in that particular year. So uh, a little bit about study scores. Study scores is what makes up your ATAR. Um, a study score is a number which represents your performance compared to everyone else who did that specific subject. So at the end of your VC experience, you'll get six study scores. Um, they come as a maximum of 50 and they are an average of 30. So basically, if you get a, a study score of 30, that means approximately 50% of students scored higher than you and 50% of students scored lower than you. And then as you go up, it increases in percentage. Again, it's a ranking. Everything VCAR kind of does is ranking students in that particular year. Um, the study scores are calculated using um, a distribution of your graded assessments. This can include your SACs, which are school assessed, assessed coursework and your exam. So different subjects have different weightings. Some of them can weight your SACs to be 60% and your exams 40, some are the other way around, some are 50-50. It depends on the unit. Most of them are around that kind of range. And so they take into consideration that, that exam and the schoolwork that you do across the year. So it's not just your exam. In case you didn't do that well the day of your exam, you can make it up um, in the schoolwork you did across the year. Those SACs can include just your normal tests, your projects, your reports, posters, speeches, any kind of assessment that your teacher wants you to do that can be counted as a SAC and will go towards the score you get for that subject at the end of the year. Um, something that's really important to understand, um, but some people kind of uh, get lost with it, is scaling. Um, so scaling is a important thing that VCA does and specific schools do. Um, and it's a constant amount that's kind of added or subtracted to the mean study score that you get. And this is mainly to take into account how difficult a subject is or how difficult a test was and how the rest of Australia performed in that subject. So, for example, Vika recognises that it's harder to get a 90% on a uh, specialist maths exam than it is to get on a, I don't know, a further maths exam, which is a lower level of maths. So they recognize that it's harder to get that and so they bump the marks up for that exam just to make it equal across the state. Um, that's also something that is really important for if you do end up going to a selective school. The tests at selective schools are harder than tests at public schools. So um, where you might be averaging a 90 in your uh, normal school right now, you may go to McRobb or Susan Quarry or Melbourne High and find that you're only averaging a 70. That's okay. That's because the tests at those schools are harder than the tests at other schools. In, a, in order to account for that, they scale your score um, and push your 70 score to up to an 80, that kind of thing, to just make it um, even across the board, basically. So your study scores, you get six of them and they uh, contribute to your ATAR. 
which we're going to go through now. Um, it basically combines your English score plus three other scores and 10% of your fifth and sixth subjects, which can be confusing, but we have a little diagram. So these are your six subjects for um, a particular student who went through VCE. Um, your English score is counted regardless of what mark you get. English is a prerequisite for pretty much every university course and it's a compulsory counter towards your ATAR. So it's best to know which kind of English is best for you, whether you'd like to do English literature, whether you'd like to do English or as a mainstream English or whether you'd like to do English as another language um, because it will count towards your ATAR whether you like it or not. Then they pick the three highest um, subjects uh, scoring subjects from your um, from your six, they count those towards your ATAR and then they only count 10% of your bottom two subjects. So as you can see, they only count 3.7 and 2.5% instead of the whole 38 and the whole 25. Um, this is really good for you because if uh, you don't end up doing so well on one subject, that's okay. It doesn't really matter because it's only 10%. The majority of the thing you need to focus on is your English and whether you know you have a solid good three or four subjects to uh, to give you the best shot at giving you a good ATAR. Basically, that's how it's calculated. Yeah. Um, Nitha, did you want to talk to us a little bit about how you should choose your VC subjects and what kind of prerequisites and stuff? Lovely, thank you. So, to begin, prerequisites for university courses are really important to consider when you're choosing your VCE subjects because by the time you get to university, you want to make sure you've covered the requirements that they need. You don't want to have to not get into a university course simply because you forgot to pick the right subject. So, as mentioned, English is a prerequisite for most courses. Luckily, it's also compulsory in VCE, so you're highly likely to do an English subject. There are three different English options in VCE, and you can pick the one that suits you best but regardless, you have to do any one of them. The next one you have is maths. Maths is a prerequisite for majority of your subjects, but not all of them. For majority courses, sorry, but not all of them. And that again comes into having an idea of whether the course you wanna do requires maths or not. If it doesn't require maths and you're not particularly good at it, then that's something you can just not do in VC. However, it is, I'd say, mostly compulsory for most courses. And the most common maths that is that again, once again with maths, you've got three options and they are further maths, maths methods and specialist maths, maths in that particular order of difficulty. Maths methods is highly common and the most required subject for most courses. And as a general rule, most courses require you to get a 25 in maths methods to get admission. The next one is chemistry and biology. These ones are not as likely as the other two, but again, come into handy for some courses, depending on what university you're looking at or what course you're looking at specifically. They're also really important to, they might not necessarily be a requisite, but they're just important to have a good base if you wanna go ahead and do Bachelor of Science, just because it gives you some background knowledge when you get to university. Scaling subjects. So as Osha mentioned, some subjects do scale up depending on their difficulty, some may scale down. So the subjects that scale up, include languages. So we see you've got multiple different language options. The school you go to might op offer many different languages and studying a language does scale your scores up. Languages are seen to be quite difficult. And so if you do take on a, sub a language then that's highly likely to boost up your score. The other one is specialist maths. So as mentioned, that is the difficult, that's the most difficult math subject you have. And so your score does get boosted up. On the other hand, further maths is seen as an easier subject, and so that does scale your score down, just to even it out between the three math subjects. So those are some of the reasons you should factor in when you're choosing your VC subjects. However, it is important that you choose subjects that you are interested in and will enjoy. And I know that's something that's often said and um, sort of underhanded, but it is very, very important that you do keep that in mind because you will often find that the subjects you don't enjoy are ones that you do not focus on as much when you're studying, and that does end up impacting the ATAR that you get. Um, whether you, if you do have some interest in the subjects you're taking, you will find yourself putting more effort into them, and that will reflect in the scores that you get. 
something just to mention here, um, some subjects, um, so basically VC units are split up into units one and two, which are done in year 11, and units three and four, which are done in year 12. Um, some schools allow you to complete units three and four subjects in year 11. So if you do, for example, like I did, if you do two, um, three and four subjects in year 11, then in year 12, you only have uh, four three and four subjects left to do. So your load is lightened in year 12. But just to mention some subjects, you don't have to do the one and two year 11 subject to jump straight into the three and four. So for example, I jumped straight into three and four psychology um, because I decided in year 12 that that's a thing that I wanted to do, but I hadn't thought of it in year 11. So if you do end up wanting to switch your mind in year 11, that is an option you can do. It's not possible for the math subjects, um, I think the English subjects and the science subjects, but the humanities subjects generally have uh, some lean way. Um, so if you decide you want, you completely hate the subject that you did in year 11 and you would like to move to something else in year 12, that is possible. You just need to check that your subject allows you to do that. Um, so we just want to talk a little bit about how to prepare well for VC um, and how to prepare well for your exams because they are really, really important and of course they can be incredibly stressful, incredible stressful time um, for all students during that, you know, that time of year. So it's really important that you make clear and concise notes throughout the year. That is going to be the best thing for you when it comes to studying at the end of the year um, in November time when you're going through the exams. If you have clear notes from when you did your subjects um, and when you went through them with your teacher, rather than rushing through to make notes at the very end, you would rather be uh, preferring to do practice exams during that time and know your content rather than be struggling. Uh, on top of that, there are certain subjects that allow you to take notes into the exam. So math methods is one of them. Um, there are two exams for math methods and in one of them you are allowed to take your notes in. So if you have a clear set of notes that you are familiar with, that all the questions that you get confused with and all the things that normally work for you are in there, that's your best chance of performing well on that exam. It's also really important to um, discover and understand what study techniques work best for you and take advantage of them. So whether you're um, a person who likes learning by talking or by writing down or um, by memorizing or whatever it is that, that's kind of your thing and makes you perform best, uh, get familiar with that while you are hopefully in your nine and your 10 and your 11 um, and take advantage of them and those study techniques when you go into year 12. Um, you can also, in top, on top of making your own notes, you can also use company notes. There are a, a wide variety of um, companies that make uh, VC notes and VC practice exams that you can borrow. Your school library likely has um, a whole section dedicated to a bunch of different books about all the subjects um, which you can use and they're really really great because they compile past exam questions, new questions, um, put them in with subjects and it's really really useful. Um, and Vika has their own, it's called Checkpoint. It's basically a compilation of um, exam questions from uh, like 10 years ago um, up till the very, um, the, the year just before yours. And so it's a really good uh, concise way to make sure you kind of are over all the types of questions that could show up, all the subjects that could show up and things like that. And of course you have your practice exams. Practice exams are available again through companies or through VCA itself. If you go onto the VC um, VCA webpage, they have practice exams for all the subjects um, from last year to 1960. So there's plenty for you to do um, and you can just work through them during your um, study, pre study period in kind of October time before your exams. Um, so we just want to talk finally about the universities um, that are um, available in Melbourne. Nitha is just going to talk a little bit about the first one, which is the University of Melbourne, which is where she completed her bachelor's. Thanks, Ashia. So yes, as mentioned, University of Melbourne, it is the number one ranked university in all of Australia. And while that does look great on your resume, again, as you do look over here, it is really important to choose a university that specializes and focuses on the degree that you want to do. Melbourne Uni is highly known for its JD program, its law program, business and commerce degrees. As I completed a commerce degree myself, 
to me, that just felt the best fit for me. However, it's important that you choose a university that provides the best course for what you want to do. It is the most, it's the oldest and most well-known university over here in Melbourne. Um, however, there is a disadvantage that all your specialization have to be done as a postgraduate degree. So anything that you want to do has to have a bachelor's degree that comes before it. Um, or she's just going to get into the other universities now. Yeah, so I go to, I currently go to Monash University. I'm going into my third year next year. Um, and Monash University is the second um, oldest and second most well-known university in Melbourne. Um, it is in Clayton, which is in the east side of Melbourne. Um, and it is quite far from people that live um, in the west side like me. Um, so that is, that is a downside to it, but it's incredibly well known um, for its medicine and law programs. Um, Monash University, instead of offering specializations to be done as a postgraduate course, meaning as Nidha said, you do your bachelor's and then you specialize in medicine. Um, Monash University offers those courses as the first, like the first undergrad um, you do straight after high school. They are incredibly, of course, difficult to get into and Monash Medicine is um, renowned for being difficult and um, but incredibly well known. And so is Monash Law, um, but they are an option, of course. Um, they are also incredibly well known for their business and economics um, uh, degrees, which is what I'm doing. Um, Monash University, along with a couple other universities, but not Melbourne University, offers double degrees. So that's where you can finish your, um, finish basically two degrees, two bachelor degrees in four years, um, rather than doing one degree in three years. Um, yeah, so that's incredibly beneficial if you have two fields that you're interested in or if you're not quite sure what exactly what you, what you want to do and you kind of have some kind of gauge it's going to be one or the other, that's a really good option. Or if you just want to finish your university experience with two degrees rather than one, that's also great. So you can do it in four rather than doing a three-year degree and then another three-year degree. Um, and then there are a number of different universities in Melbourne. As you can see, we've listed these here and I'm pretty sure um, we will be sending this uh, PowerPoint to you all so you can have a look if you want. But these are the universities and what they're kind of most well known for. So for example, RMIT is known for art, architecture, engineering, Swinburne is known for technology, Latrobe, nursing, um, Deakin University, optometry. So it's really important, as Nitha said, to pick the university that is going to be best for the field that you're interested in, not just necessarily of what looks the best or, um, you know, what kind of reputation is the highest, but just pick what course you think is going to be best for you, um, whether they have the opportunities that you want to do and whether it's the best fit for you. If you don't get into the university of your choice or the course of your choice, once you get into university, you can always transfer, you can always transfer courses, you can transfer universities. So don't let your ATAR, or whatever ATAR you get, stop you from doing what you actually want to do. There are many, many, many different pathways to get into every field. Um, and there's, there's a really wide selection of universities in Melbourne that can help you get there. Um, so that's all from us. Um, thank you so much for all your attention. Any questions that you may have are welcome. Thank you so much, both of you, uh, Shia and Nida. Mashallah, it was a very informative session. So if you guys have any questions who are attending at the moment, before we go further, you can ask here at the moment. No questions? Okay. I'll just share my screen again, and then we move forward. Uh, as we said, I've just got this presentation here. Sorry. Okay. Now, something which I would like to share with you, my experience. So I put together, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So I put together a few points for you guys to uh, ponder some thoughts on. Uh, something that I call game plan and I've, i sort of ask everyone to do a bit of a reverse engineering on that and the game plan has got a few steps that you guys need to think about and start planning okay so the first of all is what your child wants to be this is something which is very important because 
all what he, is, he or she is studying and doing and putting all the efforts in, they want, they want to know what, they should know what they want to be and you should know what they want to be. So if you can start talking to your child, maybe from when they are in grade eight or seven, it's very important. You might find what their interests are, what sort of things they, are, they normally uh, time to spend their times with. That might give you a bit of an idea. A lot of students, even when they get to year 10 or 11, they don't, they don't know what, what they want to be. But that's where the, the game starts. You have to be in discussion with them, say from grade seven or eight, to start them to start thinking on those lines, okay? So that's very important. That's what I call reverse engineering because at the end of the day, you want you, all, all the efforts that you are doing is what you want to be at the end of the day. So once you know what you want to be, then obviously you want to see what, what, you, uh, what degrees will get you, get you there, there, which degrees are available in, in different universities, which will get you there. A lot of, not all the degrees are, are being offered by all the universities in Melbourne. Certain, like, as I understand, uh, Melbourne is very much popular about business and accounting and things like that. Monash is very much into the medicines and things like that. Latrobe, where my son went, is very much, is, is the one of the best for health science. So they all they have they all have their own expertise and special specialities, you know. So once you know which university is offering what degree, obviously then obviously you want to know which university is offering offering the degree. Then you need to go back and check. Okay, if this is the degree that my uh, child wants to be, now what are the prerequisite subjects for that? Because that's very important. A lot of lot of lot of uh, uh, degrees they want to have maths biology, chemistry as, as they're one of their prereqs. So that's very important for you to know. And once you know that, then you have obviously have to go and check the school in which you, your child is, that what sort of VC uh, uh, subjects they are, uh, are being offered by, by the school. Not all the school offer all the subjects, but obviously the main ones, the chemistry and the math, the English and biology, they are being offered by all, all, all the schools. And this, there is one, one, one thing which, which I have tried and it has worked for me, for my kids, is the, the, the toughest subject that, that you have in the list. Like you, you need to have six subjects for the VC or, so say for example, biology, because a lot of subjects, they go up if, if it is a tough subject. Uh, so if you, want, if you take uh, those subjects, it will help you in your ATAR. So what you do is you, you pick up like biology is one of the toughest subjects or chemistry might be one of the toughest subjects. And what you do is you, you see if your school is allowing you to take this subject in grade 10 and year, year 11, because that way you, you, you can do your one and part one and two in year 10 and then three and four in year 11. So when you get to year 12, you will have less pressure and you will have instead of six subjects to deal with, you'll have five subjects to deal with. It's a bit of a planning that you, you need to look at. Does it make sense? Now, one thing uh, I, I would like everybody to be very careful of is, as I've said it, be smart and choose smart because our kid's career has a very brutal enemy and we need to be very careful about that. And I would like someone to tell me what, what the thing is that a brutal enemy is. Can someone give, give a guess? Jeez. It's a good question. Uh, before we go to the question, can I just ask someone, everybody, anybody, that, that, do, do you know which that brutal enemy is? Anybody know, can give a guess? No, obviously. Uh, that brutal, brutal enemy is robotization. This is something which we need to be very careful of. We don't want our kids to get into a, a profession which is going to be robotized. All the hard work they've done, all the studies they've done, 10 years, 12 years down the track, if it is going to be robotized, it will be one of the, one of the disasters. So that's where the parents and the wisdom come in the picture. They need to do a bit of research and see how, how, how the world move, is moving and what sort of jobs are going to be robotized, what sort of jobs will have less career opportunities and which ones will have more career opportunities going forward. Okay. Uh, now, if you have any questions as someone was asking, they can ask the questions. I, yes. I'm just moving the floor for the questions now. Ali Bhai, very nice uh, of you. 
and very nice present presentation by the participants. Uh, I just wanted to have a little bit of understanding and it's kind of uh, related to the brutal brutal brutality and the robotization. Yeah. Like sometimes a child also is a bit kind of confused because there are, there are a couple of di fields and domains which are the child is interested in and child and sometimes the parents are also not very much aware of the selection of the and the di and the direction of the fields where they are heading towards is there a career counselor or somebody or kind of career assessment uh, questionnaire for us like for us or for the child to assess in which field the child is having an inclination towards this is actually a very good, important question. And I have seen a lot of parents in our community who have been in this situation. And unfortunately, I don't want to obviously name them, but their kids have been struggling. They were very bright kids, and but they have been struggling and switching their degrees one after the other, you know? So unfortunately, there is no such thing as, as, far, as far as I know. I don't think any of the schools even offer that sort of, a, uh, sort of a advice. But what we... I have done, I, I do a lot of reading, I do a lot of research and people do talk, talk to me about these things and they call me, but I'm sure there are a lot of people in the community which you can talk to. And this is the thing which you will have to create your network, you know, and you, you have to start doing a bit of a research yourself and then maybe talking to certain people in the community whom you think have these sort of inf information and understanding. Um, I do also just want to add that uh, most schools um, have a career counsellor. Um, I was really confused when I was trying to decide what career I wanted to go into. And I honestly just ended up finding it by luck by chance. Um, but the career counsellors at school are really, really useful. They kind of sit your um, child down, explain the kind of pathways there are. If there's even an inkling of interest in science, then they can sort of show them the options there. If there's any interest in um, languages or arts or technology or anything like that um, they have a lot of resources that can help you sort of get there that was an option for me and I, I really benefited from that discussion with my career counsellor. Just to add on to that um, as mentioned before you can change your subjects when you get to year 12 and the benefit of VCE is that you have a variety of options so I know for me I was very clear on what I wanted but the people that aren't often choose one science subject, one humanity subject like accounting, a law subject. And that way you get to have a variety of options to try. And hopefully by the end of year 11, when you've done it for a whole year, you know what you're good at, you know what you're not good at, what you're strong at, what you're enjoying. And so if you're not enjoying science, drop the chemistry subject, pick up something else in year 12. Yeah. And so you do have an option of trying things out in high school so that by the time you get to university, hopefully you have things figured out by then yeah and also um experiment you can also experiment in year 10 i know at mcrob and i think at susan corey as well they have year 10 elective subjects um that like relate very directly to a year 11 or year 12 subject so it's just a good way year 10 subjects don't really count towards your vc so it's a good uh kind of pathway to experiment with just a random subject that they might have um uh, affected as in basically and they can try it out and see how they go and if they don't like it they can scrap it if they do like it it's something they can pursue so just experiment with subjects use your career counselors they're really useful as well yeah i think we have a question in the chat any other questions please um we have a question in the chat um does a bad school affect your atar Nilo, do you have anything to say about this um it would if the system was based on percentages, but it's not. It's based on percentiles. And so how you perform is compared to not the people in your school, but the entire state, right? So you can go to a bad school and do really, really well. You can go to a selective school and perform very badly. And it makes no difference because you are com being compared to the entire state. Yes. The benefit of a selective school and the reason people push selective schools is that these are very competitive environments. And often what you find is that being in such an environment, fellow students pushes you to work harder and perform well. So that, like Arsha mentioned before, the tests you would sit in a selective school in year 9, 10 are just harder than what you would have in a public school. The idea being that if you get pushed harder, you perform better. And so overall, throughout the state, you then perform better than most people. Yeah. Um, 
when it comes to saying a bad school, it really depends on what you're measuring it against because things like selected schools, for example, have very good and strong resources in terms of good teachers, past students, things like that. So it's also important to just keep in mind what you're comparing it against. Yeah, if you think your school is going to, in terms of the people that are there or the work environment, or maybe they just don't have the kind of subjects you want to do, then definitely think about um, selective schools and that could help your ATAR. But that being said, if you work hard on your subjects, you can definitely get into the highest course or the, get the highest ATAR. Um, as Nitha said, it's it's a percentile. So it's just a matter of whether you need those resources, whether you would like to be in an environment that kind of pushes you to work harder or whether you think that you um, are able to do it at the current school you're at. There's, yeah, nothing really um, inherently bad about a school. Um, we do have another question. Um, it says, can we go to a private school and still get a good ATAR score? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's exactly the same. It's pretty much just in a matter of resources um, and, and the kind of teachers that they have, um, the kind of subjects that they provide you with, whether the work environment is conducive to you working hard. If, if you're likely to get complacent with the, amount, with the kind of people that are there, it could affect your ATAR. If you're not likely to get complacent, then it's, it's just up to you. It's a percentile of how hard you work. Um, is there anything to say about that? No, no, agree with that, definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not really the school, it's just a matter of how you, how you fit into that school and whether you think it's going to affect you or not, yeah. Any other questions anybody has? Okay. So I think we, we can wind up here if no one could, has any questions. I just want to thank everybody who has attended and I would like to wish all, your, all of your kids best of luck for their education career. And thank you very much for KSIG Melbourne for organizing such, a, such an important seminar. Thank you very much. Asalaamu Alaikum.